I wish he would come tonight, don't you? I look about on the storm without that breaks o'er a weary world. And I think as I watch the winds that blow, tis time for the master to come, I know. I wish he would come tonight. 
For the road is long, it has lost its song, and its last dim lights burn low. But I think of the Master's promise to come, and I know that the waiting is almost done. I wish he would come tonight. You know, it's the folks that are looking for him that are going to be happy when he does appear, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Hebrews 9:28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Oh, all will see him. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Yes, every eye shall see him, but most all will look with terror. But there are some that will look with joy. They'll be able to say, this is the Lord, we've waited for him, we'll be glad and rejoice for his salvation. I like the way Paul puts it in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, in the eighth verse. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Yeah. There's not only a welcome awaiting us, there's a crown prepared. There's one laid up for you if you love his appearing. Banished to rocky Patmos, the aged John, the beloved, was given visions of glory. And last of all, he was shown that wonderful reward awaiting the people of God. He saw the coming of Jesus, finally saw the city coming down. You've read it here in these closing chapters of the book. And then the last thing that Jesus had him write down was this. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And John's response was immediate and heartfelt. Amen, even so, come. Lord Jesus. The more we love him, the more we want to see him. I wonder what's keeping him. Is there anybody here that expected him before this? I wonder what's keeping you. Well, I'll tell you this, my friends. When the bride is ready, the bridegroom will come and will not tarry. Turn to Revelation, the 19th chapter. 7th and 8th verses. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. I'm just wondering if there's anybody looking on the bargain counter to find a dress to appear in at the wedding. Be too bad, wouldn't it, friends? 
be too bad to get something that was shopworn, soiled by the handling of many hands. I don't believe it would pass inspection. And certainly if we had any love for Jesus, we would want to give him the very best and be clothed in the very best when he comes. Am I right? Oh, yes. Well, that's why he's waiting, pray. He's waiting till the bride is ready. For this says, The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. John wrote that down hundreds of years ago. He wrote it down prophetically. He wrote it down as he heard it and saw it in vision. But it's not true yet, friend. Not fulfilled yet. It's still ahead of it. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You see, we're not left here to interpret the symbolism that's done for us by inspiration. <laughs> We're told here exactly what the wedding garment is. It's the righteousness of saints. You know, there are those that seem to think that you and I are going to ride into heaven simply covered by the righteousness of Jesus with nothing in our lives, on our part, whatsoever. That's one of those half-truths which can be dangerous. As far as merit is concerned, friends, our salvation is entirely the work of Jesus Christ in the life that he lived here on this earth and the death he died for us upon the cross. Without any work or merit of ours adding to it or pertaining to it whatsoever. That's the way we're justified. That's the way our sins are covered by that precious life which he lived for us and gave for us, imputed to our account, his righteousness is perfectly adequate to make up for all our deficiencies. But I want to tell you something, friends. Until that life which is imputed to us is lived out in us, we're not ready for his coming. until that righteousness which is put to our account when we accept Jesus is demonstrated in our daily actions and words and thoughts, the bride is not ready. The bride is not ready. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right here in this world, God is going to have some people in whom the life of Jesus is demonstrated. Those are the ones that the 14th of Revelation and the 12th verse talks about. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Satan says it can't be done, never will be done, never has been done. No use to expect it. But the word of God is clear, friend. It will be done. Oh, I'm so glad, aren't you? 
I'm so glad that when the Savior comes, he won't find his church clothed in rags. You know, the Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But oh, there comes a change, there comes a transformation. Read about it over here in Zechariah. I like it. In the third chapter of Zechariah, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen rebuke thee, chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he, this is Jesus speaking, he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment, and I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Oh, I think that's wonderful, don't you, friends? It is wonderful. Notice the seventh verse, thus the eighth verse. Hear now, o Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Let me tell you, the whole universe is going to wonder when in this last generation the people are brought forth, the people of God, as saints, as holy ones, without spot or blemish or any such thing. I repeat, the bride will be ready when the bridegroom appears. Let me state it the other way. The bridegroom will appear when the bride is ready. That's the thing we need to emphasize. That's the key to this whole delay, this long tarrying time. I want to read you something from Great Controversy, page 458. It was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He desired to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there a holy, happy people. But they could not enter in because of unbelief. They took 40 years to do what they could have done in two years. Because of their backsliding and apostasy, they perished in the desert and others were raised up to enter the promised land. Now listen, in like manner, it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed. And his people should remain so many years in this world of sin and sorrow. But unbelief separated them from God. Oh, friends, God is not to blame for this long delay. No, he isn't. For nearly three times 40 years, we've been wandering in, the, in that wilderness which lies between the Egypt that we have left and the Canaan to which we wish to come. When will we cross Jordan? When will we leave these wilderness wanderings and enter into the promised land? When the righteousness of Jesus is lived out in the lives of his children. When heaven can say without perjury, here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then he'll come, friends, and come soon. I'm so glad we can help 
solve this problem, aren't you? Second Peter, the third chapter, the twelfth verse, noting the margin, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God. We're not only to look for, yearn for, long for, plead for, pray for the coming of Jesus. We are actually to hasten his coming. How? Oh, by entering into the living of the life of Jesus, by accepting his righteousness, not merely to cover the sins of the past, but to keep us from sinning today to keep us from yielding today to the temptation that got us down yesterday. Thus, we help to hasten the coming of Jesus. And then, with that, we are to reach out our hands to draw others into the circle of his loving presence. We are to lift up our voices and tell others the good news that he's coming and how they too can be ready to meet him. In that double work of gaining victory in our own lives and winning others to his message, we are hastening the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hastening the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I repeat, I am glad that we can hasten. Aren't you? You know, on this matter of getting the victory over sin... On this matter of reaching the place where temptation loses its power to subject us, power to conquer us, on this matter, friends, there is only one answer. It's the answer of the cross. It's the answer of the sacrifice of Jesus. In Gethsemane and Calvary, as he gives his life for us. It's only as we know the cost of sinning that we shall quit sinning. And the remnant these men wondered at that I've just read about here in Zechariah 3 will be more conscious of the suffering that sin has caused Christ than any other group of people have ever been. The reason they will be more conscious of it will be because they look to it more earnestly. You know, we see what we look at. We don't see what we don't look at. And if you and I would like to join in earnest in getting ready and helping others to get ready, then we will turn our attention to Calvary and Gethsemane. And there we shall gather to our hearts those evidences of God's love and sin's hateful character, such evidence as will spoil sin for us. I want to share with you some verses. A prayer that just came to my attention from one of the hymn writers of long ago. It's impressed my heart. I think it will yours. Ever when tempted, make me see beneath the olive's moon-pierced shade, my God alone, outstretched and bruised, and bleeding on the earth he made. And make me feel it was my sin, as though no other sin there were, That was to him who carries worlds a load that he could scarcely bear. 
fact, the blow finally broke his heart, didn't it? Here is the one, think of it, that carries worlds, upholding all things. Hebrews 1, 3. And yet, friends, there was something that broke the heart of that one that carries the universe. What was it? Oh, make me feel it was my sin, as though no other sin there were that was to him who carries worlds a load that he could scarcely bear. Is sin that terrible? Is sin that heavy? Yes, it is. And do you know something? I want you to stop and think of it. Next time you're tempted to bargain with God and see if God won't let you in at cut-rate price. Do you know if it were possible for God to be so compromising as to let you in with one tiny sin as you view it? One tiny indulgence, one tiny bit of selfishness. Do you know that would ferment in your life until it would spoil all heaven and all eternity for you? That's right. It is no arbitrary decree of God that shuts out selfishness from heaven. Heaven would be a place of torture to any who should by mistake land there with uncleansed garments, unclean souls. One bit of selfishness, I repeat, would so firm it as to spoil all heaven and all eternity for us. Oh, let us thank God that it is in this life that we can be cleansed inside and out. That selfishness can be spoiled for us. And instead of looking upon it as desirable and attractive, we shall see it as it really is, repulsive and abhorrent. And I repeat that it is looking to Gethsemane and Calvary that makes this change in us. We cannot change ourselves. We're naturally selfish and naturally love to be selfish. But looking at the sacrifice of Jesus reveals to us one who loves us better than we love ourselves. And looking at what sin did to him makes sin appear in its true character as wholly undesirable. We cannot see the soldiers lay the scourge upon the back of Jesus and want to go up there and take another scourge and lay some more lashes upon his back, can we? We cannot see those Roman soldiers take the spikes and drive them in this hand of the Savior and want to grab a hammer, hammer and nails and start on the other hand, can we? And make me feel it was my sin, as though no other sin there were. I know this, friends. This is so real and so true and so effective that the enemy will do everything he can to keep us from looking right here in this direction looking at Calvary. He will seek to divert our minds, distract them with thoughts of this, that, and the other thing. But oh, if we will look, our hearts will be changed. If we will behold what he did for us, the magnetic pull of sin will be broken and we shall be attracted to Jesus with a drawing power greater than anything in this world. 
May we bow our heads. Precious Lord, we thank thee tonight that thou art coming and coming soon. And we join in the prayer of thy church, even so come, Lord Jesus. We wish it could be tonight. But oh, we're so glad that thou art waiting till thy people are ready. Just now teach us to let thee get us ready. We would turn from looking at those around us and behold thee. We would turn from admiring our figures in the mirror and behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. We would turn from the study of self to gazing upon the crucified Son of God. And as we look, Lord, work the miracle. As we behold, Change us, spoil sin for us, and reveal thy love to us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anybody here tonight that says, this is for me? God has spoken to my heart tonight. And I see that there's something that needs to be done for me to break the hold of sin and to get me ready for the coming of Jesus. Is there somebody that says, yes, this is for me, and I want you to pray for me that Jesus will work this change in my life and get me ready? there's somebody like that, raise your hand. We'll pray for you. Well, friends, thank God that so many sense of the need. And I want to tell you this. If our hearts are responding to him, no greater evidence could be found than he's around here to help us. For we never of ourselves turn to God. No man can come to me, Jesus says, except the Father which hath sent me to draw him. And so every response that we feel in our hearts is the evidence of his wooing spirit, his drawing love. And so that gives us confidence to know that he's going to accomplish the thing that we long to see done. For he would never impart the longing unless he intended to satisfy that longing. Aren't you glad, friend? Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, there may be somebody here tonight that would especially like to see God at the altar. Oh, I know that right where you are, as you respond to the appeal of the Spirit of God, he has a blessing for you. There may be somebody here tonight that would like to see God up here at this altar. <coughs> if there's one, friends, I'd like to give the opportunity I know that God is ready to meet you here and do a work in your heart that you long to have done. I would not press any with mere human urging, no. I simply invite as the Spirit of God shall appeal to your heart. A sister quoted in the testimony meeting 
Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. I say this to you, friends, if you have him. I don't mean if you're perfect. But if you know that your hand is in his, thank him for it. And pray where you are that that walk may be closer, that communion sweeter, that work of grace deeper. But oh, if there's somebody here tonight that needs to get your hand in his, come, seek God for yourself and let us seek God for you. If there's somebody here tonight that needs to get hold of Jesus, needs to have Jesus get hold of you, oh, friend, come. Come and get the help. Oh, he says, him that cometh to me, I will what? I will in no wise cast out. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come, that come, that come. Brother, I wish we could sing, Come Every Soul by Sin Oppressed. What is that number? Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Five, six, seven. Let's stand. And as we sing, let those that Christ has spoken to come and kneeling at God's altar, find the blessing that God has promised for you here tonight.
to take that hand that perhaps was once held firmly in Jesus' hand. But somehow, something caused you to slip that hand out of Jesus' hands. You've been walking not far off. From <laughs> something came in between you and Jesus. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get that out of the way tonight, Fred? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just seek the Lord right there, brother. God has a blessing. I say, wouldn't it be wonderful, friend, to get that thing that has stood between you and the Master out of the way? I can't take it out. You can't take it out. But Jesus can. Jesus can. Jesus. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise pass. Now, if there's one hesitating one here tonight, then my plea is to you. You have given everything to Jesus, you know it. You can thank God for it. Nothing to boast of of yourself, but always something to thank God for with all your soul. But ah, uh, you that are having a struggle in your heart. You that are having a burden on your soul. You that have let some idol come between you and the Master. Why not? Oh, why not? Seek God with all the heart. That idol may be surrendered. That load be lifted. That bondage given up. Him that comes to me. I will in no way cast out. Might there be one more for this place? If we're just brave and come, say yes, God's been calling me, and right now I'm going to come. Right now I'm going to break with sin. Right now I'm going to have done this compromising self. Oh, pray, come. Right now, make Jesus happy. Look away from yourself to Jesus, dying for you upon the cross. And as you do that, all the spell of sin will be broken. Looking at yourself will never bring you. Looking to Him will. Yes, my son, God is you. Oh, God loves you. Children, you. Order. God love it. He's waiting to do just what we read there in Zechariah. To take away those filthy garments and clothe you with change of place. He's waiting to take away the sin and give you salvation. Yes, he's waiting to do it. Oh, let no one think that I've tried before and I've failed no use to try again. No. No, let me tell you something. There will be people in heaven that have tried and failed and tried and failed a thousand times. But the thousandth time they got up and came to Jesus and let him put them on the way to salvation and they're there. Thank God he's Lord. You know, I'm sorry to say there will be people in hell they didn't fail nearly so many times as some of those in heaven. Well, what was the matter? When they were down, they stayed down. When they went away from Jesus, they never came back like that rich young man. Oh, no, it isn't the number of times you failed. I tell you, friends, if I were you, I'd make up my mind that if you fail a million times, I'd get up again and go to Jesus. I would. I would. I wouldn't let the record of my past failures keep me. They're not keeping him from you. They don't need to keep you from him. He loves you. He loves you. That prodigal son down there in the hog pen, he came just as he was. That's right, Catherine. Bless your heart. God's got a blessing for you. Press right in there with the other girls and seek God. Oh, thank God, friends. 
no matter if we're way out in the far country there with the swine, we can turn our hearts homeward, our faces toward the Father, and he'll see us a great way off and come running to meet us and throw his arms around us in love and compassion and forgiveness. Won't he? You want a blessing too, don't you? Bless your heart. Just kneel right down here and tell Jesus about it and he'll give it to you. I know he will. Oh, friend, I don't want to see anybody miss this deal. You who know the Lord, just make mighty intercession where you stand, that heaven will have its way with every heart here tonight. Everyone. Everyone. You know, each one is as precious to Jesus as though that one were the only one in all the world. If there's just been one person that had come to Jesus tonight, be worth his whole meeting and a million more like it, wouldn't it, friend? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if everybody in this upper room were saved tonight but one, God would want us to bankrupt the world if necessary to save that one, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he? Yeah. That's how much you're worth to God, friend. Mm -hmm. So if there's one that still hesitates, one at whose door the Savior is knocking, 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 knocking. Oh, why not open the door? Why not say, yes, I must let Jesus in. I can't bear keeping waiting any longer. I can't bear to delay his coming any longer. I must not be a party to this long delay. Oh, I must not only look for, but hasten to the coming of my life. Oh, yes, I must surrender all. I must surrender all. Yes, here's some more that want the blessing. Come, dear ones. Come and see God. God will bless your soul. I know he will. Right there. Thank God. And is there another that said, This is my heart. God has spoken to my heart. Tonight, I must go and seek God. Tonight, I must go. I cannot drive the nails again. I cannot thrust the spear of pain into his heart. I cannot crucify my Savior any longer. Dear Lord, oh, we pray with all our hearts that just now in this closing moment there will be another soul born in thy kingdom. Amen. We pray there will be another surrender and make the arches of heaven ring with songs of triumph and joy. Another yielding of the heart to thee that shall make Jesus glad and drive the devils away. Just now come preciously near to any hesitating one. Assure each heart that they can be redeemed, that there is help in Jesus, that Christ died for them, and that right now he's here, waiting to bless them, to help them, to save them. Oh Lord, work the miracle and work it now, we pray. <coughs> Send special angels. We ask it in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Is there one more now that says yes? I must eat. I must come. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. 